Um, you, you told me once that you've uh, done at least 450 interviews, which is amazing. Um, and thinking about kind of the, the intimacy of, of an oral history, strangers invite you into their homes and share very personal details about their lives with you. Do you recall any specific interview that was um, very powerful or moving in that way? Oh, you know, there, there were many powerful interviews and, and, and two I can remember right away, I ended up not uh, publishing um, right. just because they, they were, um, the responses were so emotional that it, I, I really kind of had to back off, I, I think, to give them time to recover and, and not to push them too hard on memories. I mean, there was one Vietnamese woman who had worked on a project to bring war wounded children from Vietnam to the United States for surgery. And sort of a, a, in the middle of our discussion, uh, she she uh, started sort of looking through her drawer, and I th I thought maybe she was looking for a document or some artifact. But she then got up and walked, went to another room, and it became clear that what she was looking for was a, a Kleenex. And so she, which took us a while. By the time she came back with her Kleenex, then she began to really cry almost uncontrollably. Uh, so uh, you know, it had brought up all the, all these very difficult um, emotions. And so she was, she was able to, you know, finish the interview, but um, it didn't, you know, include the kind of um, depth of storytelling that you, you're generally looking for if you're in a published uh, oral history. And another time I, I remember interviewing a helicopter pilot who had um, been shot down and he managed to, uh, he was being chased by, uh, and almost captured, he managed to get away, but it was a really traumatic memory. And uh, uh, he said, I can't talk about this anymore, or, or I, I won't really be able to sleep for a month, or I can't, I can't remember exactly what he said. But mm -hmm. So that kind of you know, ended the, sort of broke the story right in, in half. And, um, but these things happen a lot when you're uh, doing an oral history, uh, certainly about war. Um, but but not just that subject. There, there, there are many, there are many subjects that um, get people to, you know, even family histories. You almost you always stumble on something that uh, has is you know profoundly moving. You know, even fifty years later to people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's unavoidable. But it, it's at the same time you you don't want to avoid it. Otherwise, why would you be doing these? Uh, these interviews, if you don't want to get at some of the, the, hard, the harder realities that um, they, they lived. What advice would you give a student who might encounter a situation like that? How do you handle that situation during the moment? Um, well, I, I, I th there's, there's maybe not a, one blueprint for it, but I think the most important thing um, is that you act as... Um, you know, as as humanly as possible in that moment, and um, give the person space to respond how they respond. And you know, I think if they if they start crying, you know, um, it is a respectful thing to turn off the tape recorder and kind of shut the interview down for a while and let the person gather themselves. And then when they do, you know, you make sure you ask about whether or not they they are comfortable to continue or you want to stop and maybe do pick it up another day or um, or um, whether that's a question that should be um, you know uh, do you want me not to ask you about that anymore about that particular subject I mean these are sort of uh, you know basic responses to people's you know obvious emotions yeah that's really important advice have you ever followed up with someone who experienced an emotional moment during an interview to make sure that they were okay afterwards? Yeah, I, I've, I've called uh, people be, because you, you do worry that um, you may have left um, someone, you know, with some very difficult feelings, which is one of the reasons why um, I would advise people to, if, if, if uh, difficult emotions really do surface in the course of an interview, um, and you, you may have to stop and, and, but if you continue, you might want to continue on sort of less hazard, hazardous territory. So a person has, 
you know, chance to kind of recover. But still, you're, you're right. I mean, uh, I've called people and they said, yeah, it was a tough few days. It brought up a lot of really bad things. Um, and then, you know, we're not therapists. So, I mean, I don't uh, offer therapeutic advice. I just, it's, you just, I think, again, try to act like a human being and, and express, you know, concern. And, uh, you know, you, um, I don't think you have to overly apologize. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, as long as you've been candid about what your purposes are, I don't think people are going to um, hold, you know, um, you to blame. Um, I think for the most part, people who agree to do oral histories um, want to tell their stories, or at least, you know, they, they may not have anticipated how difficult it would be, but, um, but, but um, it, it can, it can actually help them um, to be able to tell their story as coherently as possible. Um, you know, I, I, I do think, you know, uh, again, I'm not a therapist, but I think some, some psychologists have argued that people have been through traumatic experiences and um, with uh, psychological trauma um, can find it to be cathartic and therapeutic to be able to put together their memories in a way that has a, you know, a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, that, that gaining some co coherence around that story can actually be a kind of antidote to unwelcome uh, interjection of memories that sort of the... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the flashbacks or, uh, or, or things that they don't have any control over.